Conyers for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I begin by expressing my pride at the work of you and this subcommittee, all of its members, in continuing to press for the truth on these important matters. Now, my dear friend from Arizona, the ranking member, Mr. Trent Franks, said, quote, this is the tenth hearing we've had protecting the rights of terrorists. Well, I'd like to yield to the gentleman to tell us about these ten hearings. Which ten hearings are you referring to? And I yield. Mr. Chairman, thank you. We would be glad to try to give you, I think that this is one of the examples. I think that this is a repetitive hearing that we've had certainly on this subject. Would you provide me after the hearing with a list of the ten hearings? We'll try to do that, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. We're not here protecting to protect rights of terrorists. This is the Constitutional Committee of the Judiciary, and it's to protect the rights of Americans. That's what brings us here. That's what this proceeding, I think, is all about, and to prevent our own government from violating the laws and treaties that obtain to torture. And so that's what we're hearing now. I counted some hearings myself. This is the fourth hearing. The first hearing, it was when Professor Philippe Sands, who we re-welcome to the committee today, who is with us again, explained in detail that the torture that was visited in Guantanamo was ordered from the top and not from a few bad apples on the bottom. The second hearing that this committee had, we had Dan Levin of the Office of Legal Counsel who told us about flaws in Professor Yu's memos and how he was forced out of the OLC while attempting to impose constraints on torture. Professor Mr. Wilkinson told us that Colin Powell was worried about torture and that the president was complicit. The third hearing of this committee, we had Messrs. Yu and Addington who refused to take responsibility for approving torture or the memos and documents surrounding them and could not or would not remember the facts. So here we are at the fourth hearing. Now the fourth hearing was necessitated because we had trouble getting Professor Fife to the hearing. It's quite likely that we would not have had this hearing if he had been able to fit his schedule in with the other three previous ones that I've noted. And I'll give him plenty of opportunity to respond to that at the appropriate time. Now, what have we learned here? We've had disturbing information coming out in an unbeaten stream about the way we've treated detainees. We've heard about numerous deaths in United States custody. We've heard about extreme methods of questioning involving the harshest possible treatment. Just today, 
we heard reports of a young Canadian detainee deprived of sleep for over 50 consecutive days. Last week, we had news of a Red Cross report that determined that it was administration officials who approved torture and that in their judgment in this report that they had committed war crimes. A respected Major General Taguba also has written that war crimes were committed and the question is how high does this responsibility go? And so it's clear that the current leadership is not going to do the investigation that our nation requires. Now last week I received a letter from Attorney General Mukasey refusing to appoint a special prosecutor to investigate the advice givers and policy makers who apparently directed this abuse. Attorney General Mukasey said that these people acted in good faith and so it would not be fair to prosecute them. Well, that starts off sounding fairly reasonable, but let's look at it more closely. How does anyone know they acted in good faith without having an investigation beforehand? How can we start off with that assumption? Final decisions on what to do in this area can't be responsibly made until after the facts are given a full independent investigation. Uh, when the Attorney General appeared before us this committee in February, I asked if he would investigate those who use waterboarding. He said no. And he said the reason was because, quote, whatever was done as part of as part of a CIA program at the time that it was done was the subject of a Department of Justice opinion and was found to be permissible. Well, after that, uh, y you know, we get to a question of calling for a special counsel is not to prove guilt, it's to inquire into whether these folks did act uh, in a, uh, a normal and reasonable manner and were, were, were acting under uh, instructions. And so we asked for an investigation of the people who gave the legal approval uh, and, that, and, and of other policy makers that were involved. Uh, the Attorney General says that they cannot be investigated either because they were simply responding in good faith to a CIA request for approval. So here's the problem the Committee on the Constitution finds itself engaged in this morning. We can't investigate those who did the waterboarding because they had legal approval. We can't investigate those who gave the approvals because our intelligence agents relied on them for advice. It's a perfect circle that leads us round and round and round and nowhere closer to the truth. And so I, I say to uh, all the members of the committee, uh, this isn't repetition. We're just trying to find out uh, what's happened. And I, I thank the chairman for is giving me additional time to make this statement.